Cherry Creek Radio has been furnished a fee for the following program. The following program does not reflect the views and opinions of Cherry Creek Media. You know I'm a dreamer. My dreams came true. Keller Williams, I owe it all to you. I'm on my way. I bought a home. Home sweet home. One more night And I'm coming off This long And winding road I'm on my way I have a new home Home sweet home Thanks Keller Williams I love my dream home You're tuned to Home Sweet Home. And now, here's Russ McClellan. Good Saturday morning to you. This is Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan. That's me. And today, I have a great guest. I have Ann Tedeschi. Thanks for joining me. Um, all masked up in the COVID land. I like it. I wonder if this COVID thing's ever going to end. And it's like... It's going to be a long haul. Yeah. You know what we're going to talk about today, guys? is this infamous magical cauldron of data and analysis of appraising. And have you ever been described as like a wizard of value? No. (laughs) Because Anne is is one of those people in our industry as realtors that we rely on. Um, There's a lot of appraisers, not as many as maybe we need right now. Uh, But Anne's been in the business a long time. She owns a company called AT Appraisal Services. Just going to get the number out there right away, and we'll do it again later on in this show. But her number is 886-8805. And again, thanks for joining us. I thought maybe we'd just kind of uh, start by, like, how did, how did you get into the appraising business? And then let's kind of talk about what an appraiser, appraiser does. Okay. Well, uh, actually, I just kind of stumbled into the business. Um, uh, my education is actually in forest uh, technology and uh, wildlands recreation management. Uh, I actually am from upstate New York. I got a a technical degree in forest technology and came out to work for the Forest Service, and I designed motorcycle trails and 4 by 4 trails (laughs) for the motorcycle, uh, for the Forest Service. So then I quickly learned that um, to be anything other than a tech, I had to go get my my four-year degree. So I went back to school out at Eastern and WSU. Uh, Once I graduated from there, I got on with Washington State Parks as a park ranger, uh, I worked in two parks, Crawford State Park in the northeast corner of the state and Alta Lake State Park, which is here in our local area. Yeah, that's a gem, by the way. That, it it that, is. I love Alta secret. Lake. It is. I loved Alta Lake. But the problem was it's seasonal. Right, right. right. So at the end of the summer, I needed a job, and I had some friends up in OMAC. So I moved up there, and uh, one of my friends worked for the assessor's office. And so I got an interview uh, with the assessor's office, actually, for a clerk position. But during the interview, they said they were also looking for an appraiser. I wasn't sure what an appraiser did or what an appraisal was, but I knew I would be happier working out in the field than sitting in the office all day. And so they actually hired me as an appraiser trainee because I had the technical field knowledge uh, that they needed for that position. And so I quickly learned that an appraisal, in a nutshell, is an opinion of value. Right. So what year do you think that was? When, when, did, when did you start doing appraisals? Uh, 1990. 1990, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I started in 1989 as a real estate broker, a uh, 19-year-old kid. Um, and it was different back then. Appra- a, a, Very you know, different. We, we talk a lot about the good old days, right? And I don't know if the good old days were, were that much better or not, but they, were, they sure seem simpler in hindsight. A lot simpler, especially yeah. with regards to appraisal. Uh, when I started... I moved down to Wenatchee in 1994 and started working for Dennis Johnson at Pacific Appraisal Associates. Right. Uh, Back then, an appraisal report was about 10 pages. Uh, It was very simple. We had three comparable sales in the report, a picture of the front, rear, and street uh, view for the property, 
picture of the front of the comp, and we were done. Kind of drive by. Woo. Yep, yep. <laughs> there you go. It was it was pretty simple. And then you could call the realtors back then too and say, "Hey, what do we need to get? What value was that?" Yeah. And then <laughs> kind of, we'll they, they frowned upon that. Yeah. Uh, we as appraisers, we didn't do that, but we did have a lot of people calling us trying yeah. to. Realtors had no uh, no shame. Yeah. Hey, 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 this is what I need. This my, my buyer wants to buy this. Yeah. So right. you know, it's funny too. In real estate, when I started, it was one page in a purchase and sale agreement for everything. Yeah. Well, everybody represented the seller, even though we didn't. We re- but in writing, we did. And financing, all contingencies, everything was in one page. You filled it out by hand. But that's going way back when, when there was the MLS book, you know, that was delivered. We used to so, physically tape our photos onto the report. <laughs> right. You had to go get them processed and then tape the, the pictures into the report. So you probably, like, I, I remember spending a lot of money at One Hour Photo. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and before that, it was like the Kodak uh, Instant you know, yeah, I got my first digital camera in 1995. It was like $900, and I you could remember. take 48 pictures before you had to download. Ah, a little reminiscing. I had the Sony, the, the three and a half inch floppy disk that put went into the back. It took 10 pictures. Ooh. It was yeah, it was expensive too. It was like a thousand bucks. And uh, everybody was fighting for it in my office when I owned Lakeshore Properties years ago. It was kind of fun. But you know what's what's exciting about how things evolve? You know, there's usually reasons why. And unfortunately, sometimes it's a windshield wiper where we'll have one problem and then the government will tell us what to do. And sometimes we go the other direction a little too far. And it seems like in my 32-year career, whatever it's been, uh, it seems like that's kind of constant. And what we end up doing is layering and layering and layering and layering. And pretty soon we have an affordable housing problem. Pretty soon we have a shortage of appraisers. You know, um, and let's talk a little bit about that challenge for you as an appraiser. So as things evolved, um, you know, all the way up to about 2008, it was, you know, kind of the same, right? I mean, we we didn't really change. It was after the collapse of the residential market that things changed drastically for appraisers. Right. And And everything we do changed. Yeah. So that Dodd-Frank legislation, that was a big part of the mortgage industry collapse the the recession, the Great Recession, as we talk about it, that happened started in about 2008, September of 2008, roughly, and lasted two or three years. Depending uh, on where we you actually, were. in our little valley, were about a year behind the East Coast. It, it, it seems like Seattle's about six months behind what happens on the East Coast, and Wenatchee's about six months behind Seattle. Right. So we didn't really even see the market until about 2009 change here in the valley. Right. And so, but part of the regulations you're talking about is is um, they've standardized our forms. They standardize how we enter the data into the forms, and they've legislated how we derive our data. And now, instead of just saying, oh, I think it's you know a $50 adjustment here, or we didn't really support our adjustments back then. But now we have to support statistically everything we do in the report. Yeah, so let me paint a picture. I mean, it's kind of how it goes down for people that are curious if they haven't bought a house or refinanced. You'll go, if you're going to buy a house, you're out there uh, hopefully working with a realtor. I love you guys that don't work with realtors, but I'll tell you, man, <laughs> maybe back in 1989 it was, it was okay, but right now, whew, and make sure you interview people because like any industry, they're not all the same. So you really need to interview um, and get some representation because there's a lot of rules that can really trip you up in a hurry. And, and it's a litigious game. I mean, let's face it. The world is litigious. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. Um, but representation is a big deal. And, and, and that's very true. Um, even when I purchased my home, I hired a realtor. I also hired a home inspector. Even the home I bought was only 10 years old. Yeah. You just never know. You never know, yeah, to, to that degree. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about how home inspections actually help you a lot. I'm a big fan of pre-list home inspections. I like to know what's going on. I like to be transparent. I know there's various schools of thought on that. Um, Appraisers love you to do that up, <laughs> up, up in advance. Right. Well, it prevents double-dip negotiating a lot of times because, there's unfortunately, there's realtors out there and just people that will say, hey, I'll, I'll pay you whatever, but I want an inspection. They'll wait till the last day of the inspection. They have no intention of giving you what you what they said they would. There was no intention of good faith. It was just a, a misleading emotional trap to get you to think that you're going to sell your house. And then the last day of the inspection, they go, okay, by the way, we're going to disapprove this inspection because it's at our sole discretion. And then, we'll, But we'll offer you twenty five grand less. I see the U-Hauls packed up in the front yard. So you got to be very careful when you're looking at purchase and sale agreements. If that, if that feasibility or that inspection date is too close to the closing date, 
that's going to create pressure that a not-so-scrupulous person might take advantage of. So one of the ways that I, as a real estate broker, try to try to just eliminate that issue is say, hey, look, we have an inspection. We've addressed these issues that needed to be addressed before we even listed it. We fixed this. We fixed that. And now here's a copy of it if you'd like one. Now, just like a note, you need to get your own inspector to endorse it or you need to get that inspector to endorse you to make sure the licenses and the warranties are involved because they're specific to the person that ordered that inspection report typically. But it is a great way to get stuff out in the open and help help the whole process, right, like you said. Well, and it's very helpful to the appraiser to have that up front because now I know going in there's no st- structural issues that I have to deal with in this appraisal report. Right. So to get kind of get fundamental, a, bank's, a buyer's going to pay for an appraisal. They're going to make an application at a bank or a mortgage company or online at a mortgage company, um, wherever you're going to do it. Um, Then there's going to be a scenario where the lender says, okay, well, you qualify as an individual, but we also need the house to qualify. So we need to get a third-party independent person, i.e. an appraiser, uh, to go out there and tell us not only what it's worth, but to watch for things that maybe would be defects that would make the home essentially not financeable until those defects were fixed. So you have a lot of pressure on you because yes. here we are. Here's the here's the reality. I'm an aggressive real estate broker, right? You hire me. My job is, I mean, I'm aggressive. I market. I've been in the business 30 years for a reason. I mean, I know how to go get some people some money, right? So the idea is that I'm going to press that price as high as I can press it for you if I'm representing the seller. Right. That's my job to get you the most amount of money in the least amount of time. When we come back and I want to I want to talk about what challenges that creates for you as a, as a historian, because you got to prove what old Russ is out there doing. And all us aggressive I have to crazy. be able to support that in the appraisal. <laughs> right. Correct. They just don't take my word for it. Right. Like, <laughs> gosh, dang it. All right. So when we come back, we're going to talk about how does that work? Actually, if I sell your home for more money then maybe the market demonstrated historically and what challenges an appraiser is going to face when and if that situation comes up. And in our appreciating market, especially in this post-COVID land, there is an invasion of money coming from the west side of the mountains, and it is becoming challenging, especially challenging in a, sh- in a shallow inventory, a pond with not enough houses. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. Home sweet home. Thanks, Kayla Williams. I love my dream home. Hi, this is Russ McClellan, operating partner and designated broker of Keller Williams Realty, North Central Washington. Hey, thanks for tuning into our show each and every Saturday morning. I wanted to share the fact that we've been in business now about a year and a half. We have over 50 real estate agents, and there's a reason for that. Mainly, it's relationship and culture. You know, sometimes people definitely look at the money and the commissions and the splits. But at the end of the day, it's about relationships, trust, that familial connection that you have at Keller Williams. That's what we strive to do, and that's how we look at our clients. We now have offices in Brewster, Chelan, and Wenatchee. We have agents in Wenatchee and East Wenatchee and Kashmir and Leavenworth, Chelan, Brewster. Really having a good time. So if you're interested in learning about why is Keller Williams Realty growing as fast as we've grown and have as many agents that are focused on their clients as we do, give us a call at 509-888-0038. Or just stop by and see us at 1111 North Mission Street, right here in Wenatchee. Hi, this is Russ McClellan, operating partner of Keller Williams. I want to thank you for supporting my radio show as we enter our third year of broadcasting. We are going to continue to provide an emphasis this year on real estate education by inviting our affiliate partners to share their knowledge and expertise, as well as discuss current real estate trends and topics with all of us. I'm also excited to introduce our Keller Williams brokers individually so you can get to know them as I do. Sincerely, thank you for supporting Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and friends. Call us anytime at 509-888-0038 or stop by our office at 1111 North Mission Street. You're tuned to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan. Hey, welcome back to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan this Saturday morning. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, we're talking appraisers, appraisals, and real estate brokers. And what does all that stuff mean with lending? And, you know, bottom line is people want to buy a house, right? And I'm with Ann Tedeschi with AT Appraisal Services. Ann's been around uh, as long as I have almost, maybe longer. I don't know. 
1989, pretty close. We've been in yeah. this crazy industry <laughs> together. It's a long time, it's, a lot of changes. Yeah, we've known each other a long time, and we've, uh, I know she's helped me out on in many cases, and, and I've tried to provide, I always try to provide as much information as I can to appraisers when they ask. It's kind of a funny world right now because we can't be buddy-buddy like we used to be. Uh, that was part of the post-recession world, like, hey, those darn realtors and those appraisers, stay away from each other. Don't talk don't, to each don't other. Don't sell yourself short. I rely on realtors <laughs> all the time. I want to make sure that I'm viewing the market some, the same way you are. So. Right. And what we were just talking about in the last segment as we, went, as we took a break is, hey, my job is if you hire me to get you the most amount of money as a seller as I can, right? So – I'm not looking – I mean, I'm going to use market analysis. That's the word we use, broker price opinion or comparative market analysis, CMA, BPO, those acronyms. That's basically what we call it when we do the work similar to an appraisal. appraisal. It's not nearly as complete, but we do look at, okay, what is sold that is like – of like kind when we're going to go price a house? We also look – and I look at this more – I, I mean, maybe everybody's a little different, but I look at it like this way. I know there's a certain amount of buyers that are going to buy a house. And so I look at the competition as a big part of that component. You know, if I have 100 homes that are competing with you, you're going to have to be in the top two or three of these 100 homes. If I have no homes that are competing with me, like I have a special zoning or I have a special type of property that there's, you know, just nothing available, then you're probably going to be just econ 101 supply and demand, you're probably going to be able to pull a higher price than you would have because you have very little competition. Well, right now we're in a very interesting time. We had very low inventory before we got the COVID virus. And in the COVID virus land, what's ended up happening, guys, at the bottom line is, and there's article after article from Forbes to Wall Street Journal every day about companies adopting policies through this virus and then post-virus, if and when that ever happens, that they're allowing people now to work from home where before they were many, many people in companies were resistant to that. Now, what does that mean to us locally in North Central Washington? Well, the average Facebook employee, I was uh, told in a meeting a couple weeks ago on a big conference call with Keller Williams Nationwide, the average Facebook employee is making about 240 grand a year as just one example. And that person's about 29. So let me say that again, 29 years old, making 240 grand a year on average. They used to have to live in Seattle, let's say, uh, in order to make that kind of money. But now Facebook, Zillow, Microsoft, Amazon, yoga studios, construction companies, medical workers, you name it. Everybody's embracing this concept because they really had no choice when the quarantine hit to stay focused, right? At the end of the day now... They're like, man, you're more efficient. You're not just sitting around eating bonbons and watching uh, whatever you watch. Tiger King back in the day, I think that's over now. But whatever you're supposed to be watching, you're not, you're not working. I'm worried about that. And what they're finding is that people are much more efficient. Long-winded way of explaining that there's going to be a lot of buyers coming over the hill from the west side of the mountains, which is unfair economically to the buyer, to the people that live in north central Washington and work, you know, teachers, cops. I'm talking professionals not your part-time yeah. workers. I'm we talking. just don't make the same type of wages and we can't compete with them on value. Right. So we had a supply problem of houses before this happened. Now we're seeing an invasion and that is gobbling up houses on a daily basis. I think last weekend I saw something, uh, it was like 35 homes sold in Wenatchee in two days. I'm real concerned and I'll just put it out here on there. If we're at a, I don't know exactly what we are, maybe a 60 to 90 day inventory where if we stopped listing another home, we'd sell everything we have in 60 days. It's not very long. I'm concerned that in 100 days, that might be a 60 day inventory, might be a six hour inventory. Now, let's talk about, Ann, from your perspective. I sell a house for a year ago, it sold for 400. Let's let's take this, this example to the extreme. I sell it for 500 a year later, a hundred thousand dollar appreciation, 20% appreciation in one year. You're going to be looking at me going, the bank's going to be looking at the appraisal going, okay, how are you going to support that? Right. So the first thing that happens is my client that's excited that just bought this house because there's not that many and they, they have the money and they want to live in, you know, North central Washington, Leavenworth, Chelan, doesn't matter. OMAC, Brewster, Monachi, anywhere. So they're cool with it. They go to their bank. They're going to put, 
their money down and they go, okay, the bank goes, whoa, all right, well, we're going to call an appraisal in and double check, make sure that we're not going to get screwed over on this because we also do, as bankers, remember the Great Recession. We yeah. do remember when <laughs> things got a little bit out of control and everybody could borrow a million dollars that had a pulse. You know, that kind of skewed the numbers a little bit. And then one day, nobody made the payments, adjustable rate mortgages screwed everybody, and that's what led to the Great Recession, one of the things. So a bank will call you. Now explain to the people what happens in on your end when Russ is all beating his chest. Yay, Russ, I sold a house <laughs> for five hundred grand that sold for four hundred grand last year. Because my job, my fiduciary obligation is to make that seller the most amount of money I can. That's why they hired me and do it in the best way possible. Your job is now to document. It's to try and try and uh, an appraisal is basically an opinion of value. My certification says that I am a neutral third party. I have no skin in the game. I'm to reflect the market in my appraisal. So in this scenario, it's going to be very challenging. First of all, I have to run statistics and see, has the market really appreciated that much? And so I'll look at, you know, the past year versus the year before that. But I'm also going to break it down in the past three months because when you have a real hot market, Things can change. An appraisal is only good for three to six months. Really? Because market changes Mm -hmm. can happen very rapidly. And so a value I put six months ago may not be the same market we have now and may not be the same value. So in trying to find comparables that will support your $500,000 sale, I will be data mining the, the multiple listing service, but I will also be calling you and say, hey, how did you value this? Do you have any other sales or listings or pending sales that may not have shown up in my research that I can use? I just did one recently of a, a waterfront home. The realtor gave me three $2 million sales of waterfront homes that had just closed within the last month that had not been put into the MLS yet. Right. So I had no access to that information. And if I hadn't asked the realtor, where would I get it? Right. And, and, you know, there are rules in our MLS that govern that. I mean, that's one of the things I'm constantly talking about with uh, Northwest MLS and Flex both, but getting people to follow the rules, yes. right? Like, because the rules are in place that we need to put that data in. And, and it doesn't do any good for people to be out there bootlegging the system and hoarding that data. And I, know, I don't think they were hoarding it. It was just so recent they so hadn't recent. gotten it in there. Yeah. Yeah. There's some so, real legitimate. I mean, you have a certain reasonable amount of time to get it in. There's also certain things that happen off the books. Right. And that doesn't help anybody. I, I've, al- yeah. I've always said, you know, that that hurts you on the next deal because now, you know, here we are in this example. Anne is going to have a hard time given, you know, the value, even though maybe I could sell that home for 500 grand in our, in our example over and over and over again because there's nothing like it. So it, it becomes this real challenging, his, you know, I'm on the front edge as a real estate broker. You're an historian trying to find the data. We're trying to work together to – nobody when, – when sometimes you have to come in and say, okay, well, the value is less than you sold it. It's not that – I think it's important for people to understand. It's not that you're an evil person, right? right. You're, not the, you're not the doom and gloom kill, you know, deal killer land. No. You have been given a very specific, very challenging task as an appraiser, correct? Correct. From the law. Yes. Could you explain like what happened after 2008 the, and what things changed? Yes, and I'll also explain, like I was telling you earlier, the difference between an appraiser and a realtor. Uh, The way it was uh, taught to me is that we're all driving down the road in the same car, but the realtors are sitting in the front seat looking out the windshield at the future, at what they think a property will bring. The appraisers were in the back seat looking out the rearview window at what people actually paid for properties. So we're going to be a little bit behind where you are, Um, because we have to use closed sales. But in order to help mitigate some of that gap, we also use pending sales and current listings to help get that most recent market data. Uh, The most recent in time and the closest in proximity is what we're looking for to get the best sales to use in our appraisal report. Right. I can see we're in a metropolitan area. You have a subdivision. you got 700 McMansions in a row. It's pretty easy. you got sales. Yep. In rural America, that's not always it's the case. It's very difficult. 
Yeah, so in rural America, here we go. We got a house that's – and then you're dealing with secondary market people, meaning that originate the, – those rules originate in Washington, D.C., and right. then they get translated down to these underwriters who work for the bankers, and they're scrutinizing everything you're doing to protect the bank. And they've also legislated how we do it. Yes. And, and that's totally changed the appraisal field. Right, which is, uh, you know, we're coming up at the end of this second segment. In the next segment, we'll talk about, like, how exactly did that legislation limit the amount of appraisers? And that could be a good thing. But it can also be a very challenging thing. I appreciate it. Man, getting in, getting some good talking about appraising, about selling. We're actually talking real estate today on a real estate show. I like it. Don't get used to it. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Thanks for tuning in. Home sweet home. Thanks, Keller Williams. I love my dream home. Hi, this is Russ McClellan, operating partner with Keller Williams Realty and the host of this show, Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and Friends. I want to take just a minute to say a heartfelt thank you for your support and tuning into our show each and every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. I'm very proud to share that we are celebrating our 50th radio show this month and launching into our third consecutive year of this show, all thanks to you. I also want to thank all the amazing people that were kind enough to come on the show and share their stories, thoughts, fears, wisdom and experiences with all of us over the last two years, including my co-hosts and friends, Sharon Crockett and Michael Maher with Prime Lending. I personally have made some amazing friendships as a direct result of this radio show, and I couldn't be more grateful. As always, throw the phone in the drawer, be present, spend some time with your friends and loved ones, and make it a fantastic Saturday. Thanks again for your amazing support of Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and Friends. Hi, this is Russ McClellan, operating partner and designated broker of Keller Williams Realty, North Central Washington. Hey, thanks for tuning into our show each and every Saturday morning. I wanted to share the fact that we've been in business now about a year and a half. We have over 50 real estate agents, and there's a reason for that. Mainly, it's relationship and culture. You know, sometimes people definitely look at the money and the commissions and the splits. But at the end of the day, it's about relationships, trust, that familial connection that you have at Keller Williams. That's what we strive to do, and that's how we look at our clients. We now have offices in Brewster, Chelan, and Wenatchee. We have agents in Wenatchee and East Wenatchee and Kashmir and Leavenworth, Chelan, Brewster. Really having a good time. So if you're interested in learning about why is Keller Williams Realty growing as fast as we've grown and have as many agents that are focused on their clients as we do, give us a call at 509-888-0038 or just stop by and see us at 1111 North Mission Street right here in Wenatchee. You're listening to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan. Hey, welcome back to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and friends. I tell you what, uh, I have Ann Tedeschi as my friend, has been a friend of mine for a long time. She's been uh, looking in the rearview mirror, and I've been looking in the front mirror, that window of appraising and selling real estate. We were just talking about that. Ann makes a good uh, good analogy. Basically, realtors are out there on the front end. We're trying to get the best deal, the most money we can for our clients if we're representing the sellers, that is. And that's why it's pretty important to understand who you represent in a real estate transaction, buyer or seller. Um, and, Ann, we were just talking about how you're an historian. You're, you're trying to make sense of this, and you're regulated by a lot of people. After the collapse of the residential market in 2008, uh, the government, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, changed the rules on how we conduct our appraisals. And they changed our forms. They changed how we input data into the forms. They changed how we support our adjustments in the appraisal. So basically an appraisal is an opinion of value. We describe the property. We describe the neighborhood. We describe the current market. So we know if it's a, a, an appreciating market, we know if there's a lot oversupply and undersupply, try and estimate marketing time. And then we get into the specifics of the property. We describe all aspects of the property, everything that's include, included in it, um, and then a detailed analysis of, of the home and describing the home. And then and we get into the actual, uh, what we call the comparable sales analysis, where we do a direct analysis between our subject property and recent sales of similar type homes. Basically, your comparison shopping. You're comparing the lot. You're comparing the view. You're comparing the location. 
you're comparing the quality of the home, the condition of the home, the size of the home, the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and then you're looking at anything else, garages, shops, swimming pools. So you want to make sure you have everything that's in there. Prior to the collapse, our reports were about 10 pages and pretty generic. Right. Now my, uh, my appraisals are average 40 to 50 legal size pages. Right. And it is a certified technical document used in a federally regulated transaction. They're pretty strict on, on what we do and how we do it. And if we don't do it correctly, our fines are up to $5 million in 30 years in a federal penitentiary That's always for nice. fraud. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty steep. And so after the collapse of the, the economy and the, and the real estate market, we lost at least 50% of the appraisers here in the Valley. They just didn't want to or couldn't keep up with all the changes. Right. And there's, uh, there's different types of lenders uh, or loans, FHA is a government program, VA is a government program, conventional, and not every appraiser does those. Correct. Some, some, uh, there's very few, actually, that do FHA and VA in our area. There's only one or two, I think, left. There used to be a bunch of us. Uh, most of us got run off uh, just through regulations. And Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Those regulations that start in Olympia or Washington, D.C., often start from a place, not unlike we're seeing in the world right now, it often starts from a place of legitimate Need. It need legitimate yeah. concerns, but somewhere in the land of government, it right. seems like it's overkill. Uh, uh, what, what mostly happened is they tried to make the appraiser also a home inspector. Yeah. And we are not. Right. We just do a visual inspection of what we can see. So, you know, if there's something they're hiding from us, we're not going to find it. And that's where your home inspections are so important for us. Mm -hmm. um, to have that. And when you have that up front, that's just a boon for the appraiser. Right. And we should have another inspector on another show here uh, because I'll tell you what, you know, those guys are not builders either. I mean, they have those home inspectors are there to say, well, it looks like that roof might need some work. I'm not sure it's got five years. You need to call a roofer. Or I think there's a problem potentially in the heating and cooling system. You need to call a, they're more like quarterback in a transaction and giving you the parameters of concern, the red flags that are showing up. And then quite often we need to do even more dig down deeper with an actual specialist in that area, plumbing, electrical, and so on. Yeah. But so you have all this responsibility. And so I bet, I bet it's frustrating when I, uh, when I uh, call up and go, God, you know, it didn't get my value. That really, you know, I, I did hard. I worked hard. I got a willing and able seller and a willing and able buyer. And now I got an appraiser that's saying it's not worth it. I bet that's frustrating to you because it's, like, it's not like you're personally saying, I don't like you, so I'm not going to give you the value. I mean, it, it's just saying that this is a very hard value to support right. in the marketplace. And so, and, and, the, and I always come from, what is the market doing? Okay, so we say one sale does not a market make because there might be something unique about the property, something the seller really wants this particular spot or some other thing that might be affecting this one sale. Right. But if we can get two or three or four, yeah, cause now we're making a market. Yeah, that works both ways. You know, it might be an arm's length transaction to your your brother and it might show 100000 less than it's really worth. And then that's not an arm's length transaction to an appraiser. That's right. a family sale. Family sale. And we would not use that in our appraisal right. because so you, it's not a market transaction. Right. So you got to kind of do your homework. You, you, right. And it's hard. You're like and, a little, and, you're kind of a private eye. And it, it, a sleuth. I definitely do a, a lot of sleuthing for sure. And sleuthing. that's where um, my relationship with realtors comes in handy because I can call you and say, you know, I'm working on this and I'm struggling with a comp to support this upper end of value. Mm -hmm. Do you know of anything that I can use? Mm -hmm. And you know your market. And you know what's listing and what's pending. And so you typically can help me find or you can help explain. Yeah. Right. So if I know that, OK, we had 18 people bidding on this property, I can support that. Mm -hmm. OK. But if we just have this one person and the property's been on the market for eight months and they're the only ones looking at it, but they still want to pay this high price because they want this property. Yeah. Then I'm going to have a hard time. Yeah, you know it's interesting too. The competency factor. We're seeing. I'll, I'll tell you what. I I love Northwest MLS as far as you know. I love the ability to share information. I love the ability to get my listings out to more people. But you know where I'm struggling right now is this difference between fiduciary. The word fiduciary. You should look it up. And functionary. And we're seeing more and more and more people coming from other places that have no knowledge at all of our market. 
especially on land, which has so many more variables um, of yes. infrastructure, et cetera, access, easements, you name it. I mean, it's like a different industry than houses. But we're seeing these this invasion of buyers coming from the west side of the mountains, which we've seen for a lot of years, but it's accelerating now. We talked about that. But I'm also seeing these realtors coming over, and they're trying to do a dance. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I, I get this a lot. And they'll say, well, that's my best friend, so I, I need to represent him. I'm like, I could kind of see if you wanted to represent a guy you didn't like in an area that you knew nothing about. but Exactly. And that competency goes with the appraisers, too. Yeah. Uh, we have to be geographically competent in the area we're working in, or we have to hire somebody to help us become competent in that area. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that by the time stuff hits the Internet, it's been through a few filters. There's things that are information-based that have local, hyper-local focus is the only way you're going to understand it. And it's not on the MLS data form in the Northwest MLS. Right. There's things that happen locally in small-town America. And I'm not talking about pocket listings. That's where it's you sign a listing and put it in your pocket. You don't tell anybody. That's not what I'm talking about. But when you live and breathe and, and sleep in the town in which you work, not that it's illegal for somebody because our license allows us as realtors to sell real estate all over the state. But if I had my best friend and he wanted to buy a, a downtown Seattle condo high in a high rise, it's the last thing I'm going to do is think that I can represent him. I get friends from back east asking me what their home is worth. Yeah. I don't know. I don't work that market area. Yeah, right. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to know all, everything? And I just think – so it's important to understand that, you know, it's a tough game that you're in as an appraiser. The only thing that I think we both talked about earlier that, uh, that I do get sometimes, um, like in our industry, there's a lot of levels, good, bad, people that should be out of the real estate business. Oh, same in appraising. Right. So, like, when someone comes <laughs> in and it's half a million dollar house and they give me a, a value that's 499000 on a $500,000 house. That I have sold. To me, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Because you're looking at what is the market doing and what is what is it? You're trying to reflect the marketplace. And so it's an an appraisal is an opinion of value, but it's an opinion based on on what realtors, what buyers and sellers are doing and not what I think. Right. And so it has to be it's, it's a subjective thing that you have to do objectively. I've actually told an appraiser kind of as a little smart aleck. I'm like, are you sure it wasn't $499,427.15? Because you're darn good. And there is no appraisal (laughs) or appraiser in the world that could be that accurate. Right. Um, If if you can be within 1% or 2% or 3%, that's an A-plus appraisal. Yeah. Right? And so if the sale price was negotiated fairly at this and you can support that in your appraisal – then put that. Don't say it's $1,000 less right. when you know you're not that accurate. I, I, if I can be within $5,000, I'm happy. Yeah. So, and, and I always try and make sure that I'm not messing up somebody else's because I'm doing something subjectively. Good to listen out there, appraisers. If you miss it by $1,000, take a big, deep breath. Give them the value. If at all possible, because you're not that good, man. I'm telling you. Anyway, hey, I I love this. I'm with AT Appraisal Services and Tedeschi. She's been a friend of mine for a long time, although she's probably booked till, you know, four Christmases from now. But if if you need to talk to her, her number is 886. That's area code 509-886-8805. And and I appreciate it. You know, we're we're constantly uh, facing evolution. You know, or we've never been quite in a time like we're in now. I think we're in for a, a continued challenge, uh, which is something that is uh, going to be hard on a lot of us. Going to be hard on realtors. Going to be hard on uh, hard on realtors. Meaning, like if we have nothing to sell and we have ten thousand buyers, that sounds good, but we go broke. Well, that's where mm-hmm. communication between appraisers and realtors is essential. It really is, and 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 to be professional and respectful, because again, I think. Uh, typically, in most cases, most people are good people. And if you just try to put your like, – like what's going on in our world right now, just try to put yourself in the other person's shoes for just a minute. Try to not be so instantaneously judgmental about and reactive about everything. Maybe take some time to listen to what people are saying before you form a judgment and get, your, you know, get yourself all in a tirade. I think this this reactionary world and instant gratification world and 
you know, 127 characters or whatever. <laughs> I mean, we just got to slow down a little bit and listen to each other and, and enjoy one another. Hey, I really appreciate you coming in, and it's been a lot of fun. No, it was a pleasure. Thank All you. right. Well, thanks for tuning in to Home Sweet Home and Russell McClellan. Back in a couple minutes. Home Sweet Home. Thanks, Keller Williams. I love my dream home. Hi, this is Russ McClellan, designated broker at Keller Williams Realty. If you're thinking of selling your home, why hire us? We have a few simple goals. First, our job is to make you more money in less time by exposing your property to more people than anyone in the business. Second, we will simplify the process. Your Keller Williams expert advisor will identify simple solutions in a real estate world that can sometimes get a tad complex. Third, we will save you time. We will handle the entire process necessary to achieve your real estate goal so you don't have to. We work for you. Finally, we keep you out of trouble. Let's face it, we live in a litigious society and real estate is a big ticket item. Truly knowing how to do the right things in the right order is very important. Hey, call us today and let's talk about how we can achieve these goals for you. 509-888-0038. Or simply stop by our office located directly across the street from McDonald's at 1111 North Mission Street. Hi, this is Russ McClellan, operating partner and designated broker of Keller Williams Realty, North Central Washington. Hey, thanks for tuning into our show each and every Saturday morning. I wanted to share the fact that we've been in business now about a year and a half. We have over 50 real estate agents, and there's a reason for that. Mainly, it's relationship and culture. You know, sometimes people definitely look at the money and the commissions and the splits. But at the end of the day, it's about relationships, trust, that familial connection that you have at Keller Williams. That's what we strive to do, and that's how we look at our clients. We now have offices in Brewster, Chelan, and Wenatchee. We have agents in Wenatchee and East Wenatchee and Kashmir and Leavenworth, Chelan, Brewster. Really having a good time. So if you're interested in learning about why is Keller Williams Realty growing as fast as we've grown and have as many agents that are focused on their clients as we do, Give us a call at 509-888-0038 or just stop by and see us at 1111 North Mission Street right here in Wenatchee. You're listening to Home Sweet Home. And now here's Russ McClellan. Hey, welcome back to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and friends. And Tedeschi. Appreciate her coming on. I mean, appraising uh, is a wild topic right now. And as always, in the fourth segment, we got Michael Maher with Prime Lending. How you doing, Michael? Doing good. Happy to be here. Interesting to listen to her. Yeah, thanks for calling in. Uh, I'll tell you what, man, supply and demand. Basic yep. economics 101. We have a very limited inventory. And what we're seeing, and maybe and you, you see it from all real estate companies at Prime Lending, but... We're seeing a tough job. I mean, like Ann said, you know, it's it's tough being a historian as an appraiser when real estate brokers are the front edge trying to, you know, do the best job they can for their sellers, especially if they represent the seller, right? And mm-hmm. the bottom line is when you have a lot of people looking and not a lot of houses, you know, you're starting to see these bidding wars. We're starting to see these these different price points and appreciation and it's moving rapidly. And, and Hey, you know, I get it. The appraisers are tasked tasked with a tough job when it's moving this quick. What I'm curious about is, can we talk a little bit about prime lending and, and what the process is if an appraiser comes in with an appraisal that is less than what we had hoped for when we have a willing and able seller and a willing and able buyer. And, and for whatever reason, uh, hopefully a good one. It didn't come in. What 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 are some of the scenarios that a lender would do next? No, that's a good question. So on a typical transaction, if you know if the comps are are relatively, we review every single appraisal. But if it comes in low, depending on how low, we look at the comps regardless. If it comes in at value or above, then usually it's fine and we're not overly concerned with it. But dealing with one that comes in below, there's a couple of different steps. Typically, what will happen if it's not a VA, um, VA is a little bit different. They issue what's called a Tidewater Initiative, and they don't tell us what the value they're getting comes in at, but they tell us that it is coming in low, and they kind of give us one opportunity and the agents involved to provide comps to support the value, but they won't tell us. So there's a little bit of secrecy there and a little bit of guesswork on where they're coming in at. 
but it's important to have those good relationships with the appraisers to kind of feel them out and say, all right, is, you know, is there an idea of what we can get on what we're looking at? And we submit a rebuttal or some comps to support that. And when you say comps, just, F- I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just so when you say comps, just for people that are maybe unfamiliar with the, the, the term comps mean comparable sales of yeah. like kind real estate in a similar location, hopefully uh, preferably within the, you know, three months is what they're kind of hoping for. Correct. Yep, exactly. It's funny with all the acronyms, we start throwing these around and you kind of forget that people may not understand exactly what they are. So no, I appreciate you explaining that because some people may not. Um, But no, so on conventional and FHA, if it comes in low, we will instantly reach out to the agent and quickly ask for comparisons. And usually we've had very good success because we work with a lot of great agents. Um, of getting, you know, of, of being able to support the value and get the appraiser to adjust based on those comps. Now, I had recently one, it was on a purchase on the West side where the appraisal, or no, it was a refinance. Um, so it came in, the value came in at what the person had purchased the home for three years ago, <laughs> and it hadn't Ouch. changed a bit. And I, we were all looking at this just stunned that this was even a report. So we, re, we completely rebutted the report and asked for a new appraisal entirely from a different appraiser stating that this was an actual bad report. So this is possible. It, it takes a decent amount of, of, you know, talking into and you have to make sure that this is the right time to do that because um, this was significantly lower. And we ended up getting a new report that was much better and the underwriter agreed and it came in well above what they had paid for it three years ago. So it's, an, it's, it's kind of a, a fine line on what you can say. We're not usually talking to the appraisers or requesting a certain value, but there's kind of this finesse and this dance between the agent, the lender, and the appraiser on really building the best case that we can to support that value. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really changed since the Great Recession of 2008. Um <laughs> Yeah. Really, which was 2008, 9, 10, 11. <laughs> it seemed like yesterday. Um, and it was painful. But, you know, since then, they, they passed a bunch of rules that uh, real estate agents have a, a, and brokers have a really hard time because we really can't uh, communicate directly uh, with an appraiser unless we're asked to do so by the lender. Yeah. And then what I'm finding is depending on the lender, right? And this is one of those things when you're choosing a lender. I mean, you got to understand that the lender better back you up because here's the problem. And I talked, we just talked to Dan. Um, there's a shortage of appraisers in our right. area, right? And so I've seen a lot of lenders, even though they agree with the fact that the example, you know, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen, you know, where maybe somebody missed the comparable sales and appraiser missed it or just didn't see them or didn't have time to ask for it. I'm seeing that where people are just busy. You know, they're just so busy. They're just not slowing down long enough to really, you know, focus. And when that does happen, I've seen lenders that are unwilling to challenge the appraiser. Now, could you explain from the lender side, is that just so you don't burn a bridge or is that, I mean, are you held liable if you challenge an appraisal as a lender? How does that all go down on your end? You know, I think it has to do with burning bridges because there is such a a finite amount of appraisers out there that are approved on. I don't know which appraisers are approved on which lenders' rosters, but you definitely don't want to burn bridges. But it's the way you approach it at the end of the day. You know, if you approach it from an aggressive angle and you, you know, accuse the appraiser of not doing a good job and such, there's ways to do it without burning a bridge. And we have very good relationships with our appraisers. We never talk about value. We're never, you know, it, there's a very strict way about doing that. But when we do talk to them, if we have questions about certain comps and such, we can reach out to them and ask why they used a certain comp just so we can get a better understanding of what they might be looking for to educate the realtors on what they might be looking for for comps and such um, to provide. And you know what? Sometimes it happens where, the appraiser is not willing to budge, and then it goes back into a negotiation and hopefully gets worked out. It doesn't happen very often with us because we work with a lot of good agents, a lot of them out of Keller Williams, North Central Washington, and we're able to combat that and come to an agreement and provide comps that end up supporting it. 
um, with the help from the leadership team there as well. And it makes a big difference if, if the agents have a good leadership team backing them that can come alongside them and work with them to help, you know, reach these decisions or these resolutions if this does arise. And it's, it seems to be arising or, or coming about a little bit more often than it has been, like you mentioned, because of the bidding wars. But at the end of the day, if, you know, if the listing agent's done their homework and that's the value that they deem it is, and, you know, there's comps to support it. There should be no reason that the appraiser shouldn't take that into consideration. Yeah, and, and most – almost everybody's doing really well. And, and, and we've had a – you know, as long as I can remember, I've always had a standing order if in, in, in my company, you know – Orders may be a strong word now, but, um, <laughs> you know, true. like the, the game plan is this. When somebody needs something, let's help them because it, yeah. it, it, it is an allied forces scenario, right? We're all in this as a group of people working together. Um, there's a lot of different dimensions to real estate and doing a great job. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, as a listing agent, so when you're going to hire somebody to sell your house, yeah, I mean, as a seller, you want the most amount of money in the least amount of time and and yet we need to have those conversations about comparable sales and do a really good job with homework. I mean, I'm not – I'm about pressing the envelope, right, because I'm working for the seller. If the seller says, I yeah. want you, Russ, to use your marketing skill set of 30 years in your database and, you know, it's a hot market, let – get me the most amount of money. I mean, if that's who I'm working for and I'm in, – in that example, I'm going to do that. But I'm going to also have to explain to them that, hey, look, if we're on the front edge of the world as it turns, the historian, i.e. the appraiser, is on the back end. They're looking in the rearview mirror. We're looking in the front windshield, right? So they have to prove things that have already happened. They, they try to get three comparable sales in the last three months to document for the lender that the lender's not loaning money to a borrower that on a house that isn't worth what they're paying because they're really trying to protect the buyer as much as oh, anybody yeah. else, right? And, and we all do remember 2008. I don't think we're heading that uh, way at all right now, but I can tell you that it is a big topic. So I appreciate you just kind of adding some clarity, and I appreciate the kind words. That, you know, we think prime lending is one of the best of the best, and you guys are on uh, you're operating on both sides of the mountains, but you live on this side and the east side. Um, you have an right. office right here in, in Wenatchee. Michael, why don't you give your number uh, one more time? Yeah, 425-760-8824. I know it's not 509, but I am local. I've had the number for years, so it's easier to keep it. Yeah, you don't want 17 cell phones in your pocket? with all the- <laughs> No, exactly. It's a little much. <laughs> one more thing before I let you go. Do you think the rates are climbing? Do you think they're staying the same, or do you think they're dropping? I think we're going to see the rates honestly stay the same throughout the year. That would be my my prediction, um, they kind of, you know, they've had some a little bit of ups and downs, but they've really remained steady. And I think with everything going on in COVID, um, I don't know if we can say that, but um, everything going on in the current atmosphere of, of everything, um, I think we can, I think it's pretty safe to say that it's going to stay pretty steady throughout the end of the year. Now, anything can happen, but from for over the last four months, they really haven't changed all that much. And they're probably not going to dive much lower. That's That's... Yep, I would say... Take advantage of it while you can right now. Yeah, and I think prices are going to continue to rise based on a lack of supply. Hey, thanks for calling in, bud. Um, hey, as yep. always, you know, let's throw the phone in the drawer. Spend some time with your friends and family. Maybe do it outside. Maybe you're tired of each other on the inside quarantine land. But at the end of the day, get some fresh air. Don't be coughing on each other. I guess wear some masks and try to get this thing over with. Stay safe out there. Appreciate you tuning in. This Saturday morning in July to Home Sonoma with Russ McClellan. Have a fantastic Saturday. I have a new home, home sweet home. Thanks, Keller Williams. I love my dream home. The preceding program is sponsored in part by Keller Williams Prime Lending and Frontline Real Estate. More complete coverage, more breaking stories here. News Radio 560 K.